One big question looming over the George W. Bush relaunch tour that's happening in conjunction with his new book. And that question is not about the past. It is not about the former president's same spin on his same old controversies. It's about us now as a country. When a sitting president doesn't tell you the truth, especially about national security matters, it can be hard to fact check him in real time because you assume the president has access to information that you as a citizen don't. But this long after 9-11, this long after President Bush's decision to invade Iraq, we do have the benefit of clear hindsight. We can say factually, clearly, without equivocation, without spin, whether or not he is telling the truth. And in his new book, Decision Points, and in his Think Kindly of Me media tour, President Bush is still not telling the truth on the biggest issue of all, that you might think he would know we would fact check. In his new book, Mr. Bush says removing Saddam from power was the right decision. Why was it the right decision? Mr. Bush says, quote, for all the difficulties that followed, America is safer without a homicidal dictator pursuing WMD. A homicidal dictator pursuing weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein was not pursuing weapons of mass destruction. Do we really still have to go over this? As David Korn and Michael Isikoff pointed out today, authors of the book Hubris about the lead up to the war, Mr. Bush himself appointed Charles Delfer and the Iraq study group to study this issue once and for all and settle it. They reported six years ago in 2004 that Saddam not only did not have those weapons, he did not have programs to make those weapons, he did not have anyone working on making those weapons. Saddam wasn't pursuing WMDs. And we invaded anyway. It is proven. It is empirically known. It is settled. It's in black and white. It's true. Unless you're this guy. We cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Not everyone believed him the first time around, but enough people did that we went to war under that false pretense. We now know for a fact that that was false, and incredibly, in print, he is still trying to sell it. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, can't get fooled again. Fool me once, shame on... Shame on you. It fooled me. We can't get fooled again. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, wake up. Yeah, no, anyway. Uh, yeah, so there you are, the lying sack Bush, if I can say that about an ex president. Um, man, lies after lies after lies after lies, and it's cost so many lives for those lies and you know it's it's coming unraveled folks it's coming unraveled we're going to go ahead and play bob bowman and uh he you know we'll i won't be able to come back we won't be able to do any calls the next show is on december 4th so anyway watch bob bowman and we'll probably truncate a few minutes at the end But this is great. Everything he says is right on, right on. Thank you, David. And now we'll bring to the microphone Lieutenant Colonel Robert Bowman. Thank you. As a pilot, I concur with Colonel Gap's analysis of the gross improbabilities in the official conspiracy theory. And as an old interceptor pilot, I share his puzzlement over the lack of interceptors that fateful morning. As a career military officer, I'd like to concentrate on the enormous harm the official 9-11 conspiracy theory has done to our military establishment and to the people in it. Using 9-11 as the excuse, the multinational corporations and bankers have used our brave young troops as cannon fodder in their corporate wars of aggression. They have systematically taken away our constitutional rights, including those of our military personnel. The entire war on terror is phony. And it would be even if you believed the ludicrous official conspiracy theory about 9-11. Both wars were planned before 9-11. 
The war of aggression against Afghanistan was in retaliation for the Taliban refusing UNICAL rights to build a gas pipeline across Afghanistan to get trillions of dollars worth of gas from the Caspian Sea to their tankers in the ocean. The military leadership knew it had nothing to do with the Taliban harboring Osama bin Laden. The Taliban had offered to give us Osama for trial, but the Bush administration ignored the offer for two reasons. One, they had no evidence against Osama, and according to the FBI, still don't. And two, the war had already been planned in detail to secure that gas pipeline. The war against Iraq was outlined in the PNAC document, Rebuilding America's Defenses, published before George W. Bush even became president. Its purpose was to provide a military staging base from which to control the entire Middle East and its tens of trillions of dollars worth of oil and gas. Now the authors of that document admitted in it that the American people would never go along with their plans unless there was a catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor, unquote. Well, 9-11 provided that event. Yet they were unable to tie Iraq to 9-11, no matter how hard they tried. So they came up with a new excuse, WMD, weapons of mass destruction. It is here that we in the military saw through their charade. They had us mass 150,000 troops in one small area in Kuwait, awaiting the start of shock and awe. If our military commanders had even the slightest thought that Saddam Hussein might have had even one WMD, they never would have deployed their troops so that they could be wiped out in a single attack with one WMD. The truth is that our government knew there were no WMD in Iraq. Our people in the military were put in a horrible position, either sacrifice their career and their freedom by refusing orders, or knowingly participate in a war of aggression against their oath of office and the Nuremberg principles enshrined in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So we have two corporate wars of aggression. Wars in which we are making the same mistake as in my war, Vietnam. We are fighting the people who live there. What has been the result? About 5,500 of our finest have died. The lives of 40,000 of our injured soldiers will never be the same. Tens of thousands of our young men and women have severe psychological problems because of what they have seen and what they have done. Hundreds of thousands have been poisoned by depleted uranium and will suffer lives of pain and disability and will father thousands of children with severe birth defects. Our military services are depleted and demoralized. The VA system is underfunded and overwhelmed. The National Guard and Reserves have been subjected to tour after tour, disrupting lives for even the lucky ones who return unscathed. Jobs have been lost, homes have been foreclosed, marriages have been destroyed, children have been estranged, and for what? We have alienated our friends around the world and made new enemies. We have created thousands of new recruits for Osama bin Laden, whether he's alive or dead. And we have further endangered the American people, and all because of 9-11. You know, there's massive evidence of a cover-up with respect to 9-11 itself. 
I've spoken with both Governor Kane and Congressman Hamilton, the co-chairs of the commission. And they both say that there are outright falsehoods in the final report. Never mind all the omissions. The report over which they had no control. It was written in the Bush White House by Philip Zelikow. Now when you combine this with the confiscation of videotapes, audio tapes, black boxes and other evidence by the FBI, it is clear that regardless of who was responsible for 9-11, the subsequent cover-up was itself a conspiracy involving elements of the Bush White House and the intelligence establishment. To prevent further 9-11s, we must get to the truth about all those involved in the last one. You know, the American people have never been told who was really responsible for 9-11. Dedicated researchers like some we've heard today have proven that it could not have happened the way the Bush administration said it did. Hijacked airliners do not fly around for an hour and 40 minutes without being intercepted unless our air defense system was deliberately sabotaged. And 19 Arabs with box cutters couldn't have done that. Indestructible black boxes, and by the way, they're not really black, they're bright orange, but never mind. Indestructible black boxes do not evaporate in the same fire from which an unharmed passport floats to the street below. Airliners, all of whose parts carry identifying numbers, do not crash without leaving a shred of evidence as to what they were. You know, the truth about 9-11 is that after nine years, we still don't know the truth about 9-11, and we should, and so should the families of victims. And let us always remember the victims of 9-11 include not just the roughly 3,000 people who lost their lives that day, but the 5,500 military personnel who have lost their lives in the Afghan and Iraqi wars, as well as the hundreds of thousands of innocent Afghan and Iraqi civilians. All of these victims and their families cry out for a new independent investigation of 9-11. Only when the official myth is exposed and the truth told will the wars and occupations end. The creation of new victims stopped and our military returned to its constitutional task of protecting our borders and our people, not the financial interests of multinational corporations. This one change in military mission, eliminating the mission of protecting the global financial interests of multinational corporations, will allow us to greatly enhance our national security and reduce the defense budget by 80%. But it's not going to happen until people learn the truth about 9-11. Only then will people understand